Welcome everybody to lecture one, information retrieval in the winter semester. It looks like summer semester outside, but it's actually the winter semester 22, 23. I'm happy to see so many people in the room. It feels like a party, so I think that's the first time for in years that it's so packed. It will become less, so don't worry if you have to stand now naturally it will become less in the room, more people online or via other means. But it's very nice to see so many of you here. <coughs> it's also very nice to see 30 people on Zoom. So yeah, there are many ways to participate. So let's just start. So today's lecture, naturally it's the first lecture. <coughs> so there will be a lot of organizational stuff. I will tell you a bit how this all works, how credits, exam info and so on, the course systems. There will also be a little bit of contents, but it will be very much on the light side, so it's just uh, getting started in the first lecture. And the but first exercise sheet will already be implementing a mini search engine, so as you might know, this lecture has a very practical aspect. I will talk more about this later, so mini search engine, movie search. Okay, now first the organizational part. So what's the, yeah, let me start with three demos. So this uh, course is about uh, search engines. So let me show you a few search engines. So I've prepared one here, that's uh, DBLP. DBLP is a search engine for, I don't know if you know it, every researcher in computer science will know it. It just searches in uh, articles on computer science. So here we can search something, for example, let me type information retrieval, it does search as you type, now you get all kinds of conferences, publications on information retrieval, people who have done something in information retrieval, conferences relevant for information retrieval. And I wanted to show you, and I will show this here, let me just clear these screens. This is actually a search engine powered by stuff we have done, and I can show you how it looks like if you have a search engine, it's actually used by a lot of people. So this is the search engine right now, and let's just check if we type something here. Let me just do this query again, if we find it here. Did do we, f yeah, here we find it, information retrieval. Maybe we can, and you can see it's used by, a, okay, let's just type something maybe which we, recognize a lot of O's here. Let's see if we see them. Yeah, there they are. So you see, you get, uh, and let's also look, it's here's another interesting one which I prepared for you. That's just the countries where the requests are coming from, so that's also live accumulated from when I started the command. So you see right now, it's very interesting to look at this, depending on the time when you look at it, you get a lot of requests from from certain countries. So right now we are getting a lot of requests from China, United States, Hong Kong, and so on. So that's how it looks like when you have such a search engine in action. So it's quite uh, thrilling, actually. And of course, it's a challenge to build something like this so that it always works 25-7. And you will learn how to do this in this course. Here's another one, Wikidata Entity Search. Who knows Wikidata in the room? Third of Wikidata, still few people. It's one of the fastest growing Wikimedia projects. It's like the sister project of uh, Wikipedia. And we will talk about it, we will talk about it several times in the lecture. Interesting, it takes a while to get there. It's maybe, I, yeah, let's see. So. Just to very briefly explain what Wikidata is. I'm surprised at the speed here. <coughs> so this is, you know, there's a Wikipedia article about Earth. This is the Wikidata article about Earth, and it's the fact about Earth. So let me maybe just look for a comparison at the Wikipedia article on Earth. No, not the German one. I don't want the German one. <coughs> It's a bit slow, and I'm not sure why. Maybe <laughs> the machine also has to get used to whatever. So this is the... Do you have an idea, Frank, why it's so slow? 
Yeah, but it doesn't really matter. That's the Wikipedia. You know, all know Wikipedia articles. I don't have to ask. It's just a lot of text. But you also have these into info boxes on the right, right? And you also get them in search results nowadays. And these info boxes are more of the type you have a property here, like a verb and a sentence, a predicate and an object. So the aphelion of Earth is this distance, or the eccentricity of the orbit is this number, and so on. And what Wikidata is, it's all this structured data. It's all this triple data. The Earth is a planet, and so on. And you have, uh, we will see a search on this in a second. That's my third demo. And one thing, of course, what you, <laughs> this also takes a while. Let's say we are looking for something, maybe university. It's it's really slow of Freiburg. Yeah, the lag is incredible. I don't know why. But it, I don't think it has anything to do with uh, Wikidata. It has to do with this machine or the internet. So I type something so there will be an article about the University of, of Freiburg here. But uh, just one problem, so let's look for the Ukrainian uh, president, for example. I'm typing here Vladimir something, and then I think I will not find him because he's written with a W. So if I write him with a W, I will find him, I think. It's also now I will find him, but this is something which we, so this is the official Wikidata entity search. We will actually build something better in lectures six and seven. So in half of the course, you are already able to build something better than what is out there. I think that's quite exciting. And then the data you have just seen, that's also made in Freiburg. It's one of, it's our biggest project in our group at the moment. How do you search this data, all this uh, triple data, how it's called uh, 18 billion triples? And let me just show you uh, this, uh, each statement is called a triple. There's a search engine called a Clever. <coughs> and if I click on here, you can also try this everything online. It wasn't so slow when we tested it 20 minutes ago, so maybe it has something to do with Zoom running or, I don't know, there's Camtasia running, recording, Zoom running. Maybe the machine has some problems with it. So let's try anyway, and let's look for let's look for all people with a certain first name. And let me just and I'm not explaining too much now how this works. You can just watch it and enjoy. Give me a first name that's maybe not so rare, but also not super frequent. Any name to show that it's live. Wolfgang. Wolfgang, beautiful name, Wolfgang. Here we are. There's a Wolfgang. There we have it. Okay, and now let's just. Let's first look at how many people Wikidata knows with the name Wolfgang. Things have IDs in Wikidata. Let me also add the names. Wolfgang, uh, not Wolfgang, Wikidata knows about over 9,000 people. <coughs> and since this, uh, probably Wikidata also know about where these people are born. So let's do that, their place of birth. And we're not interested in the exact place, but just in the coordinates on the map, and let's just do that. And let's add this here to the <coughs> query result, and now we have, okay, the location is known just for birthplace for over 4,000, and now we can see on a map where all the Wolfgangs in Wikidata are born. Again, takes a while, which is not the fault of... Okay. So we see there's a certain concentration <laughs> in, in certain parts of the world. So it's pretty much, uh, that's, I'm sorry that it's so slow. Yeah, I'm, I'm zooming in and out, okay. I, you can try it on your machine, it's, it's super fast and everything. It's just, uh, yeah, it's really slow. So it's mainly, mainly a German name, interesting. Okay, that's it for the demos, and let me just show you this amazing number so that you also see it here. So this is really uh, almost 18 billion, not 18 million, yeah, it's just three more digits, 18 billion statements of the sort, so-and-so has this first name, whatever about everything, human knowledge, it's just enormous. Okay, so these are the kind of, you will learn in this course, how to build something like this. What are research topics? 
behind this. The door is still open in the back, right? I think it would be good to keep it open just for air. We can't keep these things open, it's too loud. How do you do it that you have such an enormous amount of data and you get fast queries? They were not as fast as they could have been now because of uh, latency issues with this machine, but this is uh, about indexing and we will start with this today. Ranking is important, the order in which you present things. You have to store all this data in some form or the index. That's about compression. We will have a lecture about this. You have seen it for the entity search. You, <laughs> you type the wrong letter, you don't find it. It shouldn't be like this. Very important <laughs> web app stuff. It ran in a web browser communicating with something on the back end <laughs> that just belongs together with search engines very much. And you will learn all the basics in this course. There's quite a bit of machine learning. There are three lectures about uh, this when just the uh, fixed rule-based stuff doesn't work. Knowledge graphs, that's the last thing we saw. Wikidata, that's a knowledge graph. And also evaluation. You build a system, you want to find out, okay, how good is this really? You type a few example queries, that's one thing. <laughs> do it more systematically is another thing, and we will learn how to do that, like measuring, computing certain measures. Now a few more and, and you can, of course, ask any time comments about how this course is organized. So the lectures, this is very important, and we will also write a post. We have a forum. I will talk about it later. Where we, will we want to have a little more time in case you have questions, so we want to start at 5 past 2 in the future. That's why it's in red and bold here. But there will always be a part like 10 minutes or so at the beginning, which, about, which are about organizational, about the last exercise sheet, and so on. So the actual contents of the course starts at 14.15. The rest will be on the recording. So if you cannot make it at that time, that's fine too. But uh, try to make it at that time. So that this will be the start, also a little bit longer. Then we have one hour, 45 minutes. I also want to have breaks in between. That's just more relaxed. That's just from experiences from previous years. So please uh, make a note of this. It will be in this room, or you participate via Zoom, how you like. One or two short breaks in between. 13 lectures, so we actually removed one to de-stress you a bit. No lecture on... Uh, yeah, we just removed one lecture just to have it make it a little more relaxed. So there will be the Christmas break. There will be one in two weeks already. Yeah, and uh, there will be another one uh, we don't know yet. All lectures are recorded and live streamed. People on Zoom are enjoying it right now, 33 of them. The editing will be done by Alexander, who has been with us for some time now, does a great job. Everything is on our wiki. Uh, we will see this uh, later, and there's also a versioning system. I will also talk about that later. The exercise sheets, they are, as usual in my courses, in our courses, the most important part of the course. One sheet every lecture, you get one today. Twelve sheets, one less than in the last years for de-stressing purposes. The deadline is always noon before the next lecture. And here's a serious comment. It's really serious. It only affects about 10 or 15 percent of people, but not 1 percent, which is why I have to uh, say it. You are totally free and even encouraged to think and discuss about the sheets together. Yeah, meet in groups, online, in presence, however you like. But in the end, you have to code. It's usually coding or uh, sometimes also theory, then, then of course you shouldn't copy, but also the coding, 100%, 100%, not 90 or 50%. And the reason is simply that you don't learn anything if you just sit there and watch somebody else do the code or you copy code. You only learn it if you do it yourself. It's really important. And this pertains to everything, so you're not allowed to copy from the internet, from someone else, from the master solutions from previous years, which, by the way, you shouldn't even have. And uh, yes, so this is really seriously, most, most of you don't do this. <coughs> so there are, maybe let me quickly show this at this point. Here's the wiki page. 
And let me just see if this works. This is the first exercise sheet. Yeah, it works. It says here in red also, so I've now said it. It's on the slides, it's on the recording. There's a link here which goes to the wiki, where it's also rule number 10. It says it all again with a little more detail. So these rules, I mean, they're written on the exercise sheet. You should absolutely read them once the first time. It's just a one page because that's, these are the rules for the rest of the course. And you also find it on the wiki. <laughs> yeah, so it's like uh, 10 times. So there's no way you, can't, you can say you didn't know. There's just, that's, that's the point of this uh, two minute ad, ad section here. There's no way you can say you didn't know. The only exception is we write code in the lecture and everything we have written in lecture and we put in this repository that you can use. Yeah? And it's called SVN public for a reason, from the course of this semester, not from some publics from 10 years ago where maybe you find relevant stuff. <coughs> so please, uh, yeah, please adhere to this. And we are very good at finding if you do this anyway. Uh, and, and I come to your question in a second. Some of you think, and it, I have to say it again, and it affects 10-15% of people who still try it, so it's not few, it's, it's too many, which is why we have to install these rules. And people try to change variable names, change things, write it a little bit, it doesn't help, we find it anyway. It's really, really hard to cover up plagiarism. It's really hard, in fact it's so hard, it's harder than doing the exercises yourself. So I would recommend instead of investing your energy there in, in, in covering up plagiarism, uh, just do it yourself. We will find it. And there's a question. Yes, please. Yes. Um, can I use code that I, for example, wrote previously for some other project? Yeah. Your own code, yes. Your own code, if it's your own, you can do it. And by the way, that's also a general thing at a university and in science you should learn. Whenever you use something, even by yourself, just write it there, right? Just write it in the comments. I use this from there. I mean, that's how you should do it, cite, citation. So even in this case, just say, I use this from uh, some other project of mine. And it's also good practice to write, I use this from the lecture. Okay, tutorials. There will be a weekly Q&A as long as people attend. So at some point people don't come anymore, then we will just stop it or just one person comes. Time to be negotiated and let me just try one thing now. I've prepared a number of surveys and here's the first one. And I will just let this run for some time. And for that it would be good if also the people in the room just go to the Zoom meeting, take your time. I will leave this up for 15 minutes now. I'm just launching this now, ah wait, maybe I shouldn't, I, I'm just ending it now again. I'm wondering when I'm launching it and uh, hmm, and then you are participating in the meeting after I launch it, will you still see the query? And how do I end this? The poll is ended. Okay, stop sharing. Can I now start it again? Now I can't start it again? That's not true, is it? Come on, I should be able to start the poll again. There's uh, three dots here. Relaunch poll. Ah, okay, can you see it, by the way? Yes, you can see it. Okay, so people in the room, just log into Zoom. On the wiki, you will find it. I hope you can still pay attention to what I say. And anyway, there will be a small break after this organization section, so you can still... So, just so that you can prepare mentally already, it's just about the Q&A Friday this week. You don't have to come, you can just come if you have questions. There are just four time slots, and we just want to know which one yeah, is most to your convenience. And it's a multiple choice question. And don't just pick your preferences, pick every time that's possible for you. Yes, please? Sorry. It's on the wiki, and the wiki is on the exercise sheet, and the exercise sheet is on the wiki. So we have a little <laughs> circular thing here, but I'm sure 
So one thing is to Google, I, I could also post the link on Zoom, but that also doesn't <laughs> help. You see, it's uh, not so easy. So if you do AD teaching wiki or something, you will find it. Yeah, so one way to do it, I think, is if you just Google AD wiki, I think that's a popular search request. If you search at wiki, you will probably get to our teaching wiki. On the teaching wiki, yeah, let's reserve some. It's really slow. Here's information retrieval. That's our only lecture this winter semester. And there it's on the top meeting link. It has the idea here. Just take your time and then I will just issue, uh, launch the poll in, I don't know, in the break probably. There's a forum for all kinds of questions. I have a separate slide about that. You will receive personalized feedback for each of your sheets, usually pretty fast. The feedback is in a special file. We have a lot of tutors for this course. And if I can have your attention for a second while you're still, the assistance for this course is Natalie. She's here. Maybe you can briefly stand up for a second. That's Natalie. She will help me a lot. So uh, thank you very much in advance, Natalie. And uh, the style of the lectures. What will I do? I will provide motivation, definition, example. We will code a lot together. I will not explain all the details to you. You have to figure these out yourself in the exercise sheet. You only work, learn stuff by working out the details yourself. <coughs> There's theory, but uh, it will always be clear. There's no theory for the sake of theory, although that's also nice, but we do not do it in this course. I also have a question about this, but let me just wait for you. Maybe uh, let's start with that survey to see how many people. I have a, service about a survey about theory. Let me try that. Here's one, theory versus practice. Bam. Here's some options. Let's just see. I will just let it run for a few. So you should see a survey now with four questions. Your attitude towards theory. And I hope uh, the people on Zoom should also be able to, of course. There's one topic per lecture, self-contained. We provide all the materials you need, so you don't need any literature, but still if you want to look at the literature, I mean, there's Google, there's Wikipedia, a lot of great Wikipedia articles about the stuff we are doing, and, but you don't need it, you can do it. Okay, some of you are still busy with your devices. I will go a little bit slower. So that's really important. There is, a, okay, yeah, you have to turn off your sound when you log into Zoom. You should understand the concept, so I will give you the intuition. Understanding it in depth is your task. In depth, the exam will also, I mean, there's superficial understanding, that's good, and there's understanding in depth. You should also be able to implement this stuff in practice. And I think some of you have to turn off your loudspeakers when you logged into Zoom. So at university, sometimes you have an overemphasis on A, when you are someone somewhere else in a company, overemphasis on B. In this course, we want to do A and B. That's kind of a bit special about this course. There will be master solutions. They will be available, believe it or not, after the deadline for each sheet. And these are strictly for your personal use only, now and in the future. I think it's clear, but let me just say it. Let me just state the obvious. Now and in the future, they are just for your personal view, uh, yeah, which means under no circumstances should you pass them on to others except your future self, which does not count as others. So how much work is it? It's a six ECTS course, like most courses at our faculty here in the meantime. We standardized this a while ago. There's this usual calculation, it's 180 working hours. And uh, here are three ways how you uh, can do this. The recommended ways is to spend about 
eight hours a week per average on the exercise sheet and then you don't have to prepare a lot for the exam then you really because the exam will be about the stuff from the lectures which will be yeah you will exercise them in the exercise sheet you can do a little more a bit less then you have to learn a little bit more for the exam this is not possible because you have to reach a certain number of points in the exercise sheets and uh, let me just repeat it doing the exercise sheet is the best way I mean that's we spend a lot of effort on them we invest a lot of time in them it's the best way to understand everything and to prepare for the exam so the Studienleistung of the courses, you have to uh, reach a reasonable number of points in the exercise sheets, half of the points, just to make it clear that's not a real hurdle, it's just to motivate you to work on the exercise sheet. Right? Everybody, if you follow the course, you do the sheets, you will reach 50% of the points. So it's not a hurdle, it's a um, motivation help. In the end, there will be 20 points if you participate in the evaluation. This will just replace your worst uh, exercise sheet, so that will make it even easier to get the 50%. You can also use this as a joker if you want to skip a sheet or if you are sick or something like this. 50% will not be a problem. There will be a written exam in the end, written because we are so many people, around 100 usually participate in the exam date will be fixed in the second half there will be four tasks 25 points yeah you just see here how so we just make it very transparent in the beginning lots of exams from previous years on the on our page you don't have to go to Fachschaft or anywhere else they also have them probably but we just have them online you can access them like 10 at least from previous years so now we have uh, one poll here, and uh, so let's see, theory. I love math, and I hope the course has a fair portion of it. 22%, you will not be disappointed. Math is okay, as long as I understand what it's good for. 50%, you will not be disappointed. Math is tough for me, very honest answer. Of course, these queries are anonymous, these surveys. We will try the best to give you crash courses on things. And six, that's interesting, 16% wouldn't mind if we throw about out all the stupid math. Sorry, won't happen, but <laughs> thank you for your honesty. Okay, and there's another survey which is maybe, let's do it now. The, no, this is the, I have to relaunch the Q&A one. And this is now, yes, ah, interesting. This is now running, and uh, since this is the end of the, organization part we're just make having a four minute break or so before you you're welcome to chat or anything we will open the doors you will hear a nice sound and then please come back so it shouldn't take too long to come back so four minutes and then we just continue same for the people on zoom okay so see you in four minutes participate in the poll and i will set the timer and so there will be a q and a on uh, and it's really Q&A, it's not like we, <coughs> I mean the contents is in the lecture, we will just be there to answer questions, maybe it's questions with the setup in the first week, maybe it's questions about the sheet, several people will be present, so if you have very individual problems, we can also go into breakout rooms, and it will be via Zoom, <coughs> I think that makes sense, and, and just one, one event. Okay, so that's the result of that one. Ah, by the way, for the... I don't know if the people on Zoom... Could the people on Zoom already see the previous one? Or do you only see it yes. now? You could also see the previous one. Okay, great. So, back to the second half of the... Is there any question about the organizational stuff? Yeah? So between one and two and there will be an announcement about this yeah <coughs> and you can just come and ask your questions yes please no 
No, there will be no. That's the, that's the weekly Q&A where you can come and then things can be explained, but we do it in a you ask, we reply fashion because you don't need more of frontal uh, teaching where you just sit and passively receive. Yes? Specific language? You mean a uh, programming language? Yes, it's, uh, there will be a, a slide about this. It's Python, but you can... But actually, now that you ask it, let's address it now. <coughs> so the first rule is called programming language. We recommend Python because I will do Python in the lecture because it will just uh, relieve us from all uh, language-specific stuff. Python is just easiest to use. You can also use Java. I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> or C++. I don't have a preference, no. But it will be more work. So in the past, we used to support all languages fully in the sense that we provided templates and everything in, in all three languages, but it was too much work. And 99% of people used Python, so now we just Whatever we give to you is in Python. You can use one of these two other languages, but it will be more work. But you are welcome to do it if you want. It will just be more work. But in the last years, everybody used Python, I think. But for, for some of the efficiency sheet, another language might make sense. OK, this is a little bit of contents for today. And the exercise sheet will be about this. And then there will again be a break and some practical stuff. So, keyword search. So, we have a collection of text. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. That was not uh, deliberate, but yeah, why not? Keeps us awake. Text documents, for example, uh, the web. So, for exercise sheet one, we have prepared for you 100,000 uh, movie descriptions. So let's just look at them together. I think. Uh, and they are linked. So this is your, you will, for most of the exercise sheet, you will get a nice uh, data set. So let's just look at this one, 23, and it's called, as I said, it's linked on the wiki, movies, TSV. We should probably delete the other one, right? Because we, yeah. And here it is, and it's a, uh, it's just movies, 100,000 movies. You see ranking is important. They are not in random order. They are in IMDb order by a number of users who voted for them. And what you have here, so if we just maybe, t let's take just the first one of this file, head minus one, then we have the, that's the most popular movie on IMDb for a time now, the, oh wow, it's a long text, the Shawshank Redemption. You have a text here. You also have some additional columns. It's a tab uh, separated values, so several columns with a tabulator in between. That's the number of IMDb users who voted for it. That's the score. 9.3 is really high on IMDb. And uh, this is the number of Wikimedia articles about it. So basically, we have uh, text and titles. Let's just, I have, another <laughs> I have another survey prepared on this. Let's just look at the first column, just the title and the first 10. These are the first 10, top 10 movies on IMDb, and I've prepared a very important survey on this, namely, stop sharing. Which of these movies do you know? Yeah, so that's uh, of these 10, none of them, all of them, what's in between? Here they are. Okay, you can... Uh, that's the list. Just have a quick look, and I'm, I'm curious. Uh, top 10 IMDb movies. Let's see how much of a movie goer you are, and whether there are some tens among you. So I'm a 10, definitely a 10. And let's go, yeah, I can, you can also go to the file on the wiki if I'm now going away, if you want to see them, we'll just run. So now we have a keyword query. Let's say astronaut and moon. And now we want to find text records which contain these two words. That's a text search as its most basic. And for now, I mean, search engines, they do not 
they may ignore some words. For now, we just return documents that contain all the words, so all movies that contain astronauts and moon, moon for example. For the exercise sheet, just return three documents. Sheet also says something about the selection. The next lecture, we will talk about ranking. Of course, if you search matrix, you don't expect any movie which has somewhere the word matrix in the, in the description. You would expect the three matrix movies, or four of them, at the top. Yeah. So, this is just the start, first exercise sheet. In the next lectures, we will see a lot of refinements about this, which will get you closer and closer to building a real engine. Ordering, ranking is important. Lecture two, fast, how to do it fast. Lecture three, how to save space. If you have a lot of data, lecture four, er error tolerance search. Lecture five, actually building a search engine. That's two lectures because that's really a lot of stuff, but it's super important, you should know it. Synonyms, like other words meaning the same thing, and more stuff in the later lecture. Today is just the absolute minimum, but, but it's nice that in a single exercise sheet, which is not too hard, you already can build a mini search engine. And here's the solution, so I just tell you how it's done in principle. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, this is not what we will do. You can just use grep on the command line. Grep is just given a file, find all records which contain certain uh, words. I will not show it. It's actually not so bad if you have, so for our movies file it would work. You can scan through a gigabyte and a fraction of a second, but for 100 gigabyte it would be uh, too much, and if you have to search the whole web, which is 60 billion pages nowadays, uh, that would be very slow to so just go through all of them. Interesting uh, fact on the site, the number of web pages, I mean, it, it increased a lot exponentially probably for a number of years. It has pr stayed pretty constant for the last 10 years, so it's not that number of web pages maybe the number of web pages around, but not the ones indexed, but I mean the ones you have in your search index, you want to return to users, it's the meaningful ones, right? And th so the amount of meaningful content on the web, this is I think one can say, does not really increase anymore, it's just, yeah. Think about it, Wikipedia has six million articles, six million, that's nothing, and it contains like all the knowledge of the world, six million, 60 billion, yeah, you don't, it's not really about uh, quantity. Ah, let's see, let's look at the result of the survey, I'm really interested, there we have it, 21 people have seen all 10 of them, great, the other ones, 5%, okay, interesting, if you have an interesting story, there we have some non-movie goers and, yeah, but most of you like movies and also good movies. I think the IMDb rating is a, is a good one. It's, it's not tr trashy movies on the top, good movies. Okay. And we will learn more about movies in the course of this lecture. Inverted index. So how do you do it? That's what you need for the exercise sheet. It's quite uh, simple. What you do is, for each word that occurs somewhere in your text of the movie descriptions for this exercise sheet, astronauts, you have a list of the records or documents that contain this word. So, text record number 13, so maybe it's a 13th line in our file, contains the word astronauts. 57 contains the word astronaut. It's like the index which you have at the end of a book. It just tells you this word, it's contained on these pages. And you have that for all the words, and that's an inverted index. These lists are called inverted lists. Why are they called inverted? Because in a sense, when you have the document, so let's look at the document again, this tells you Text record number one, which is the first line, contains this, these words. It contains the, it contains Shawshank, it retains redemption, and so on, and so on. So for each document, it tells you the words, and this year, for each word, it tells you the document. That's why it's like inverting the data. And depending on what exactly you store here, it's actually lossless. You have, I mean, 
Company. Here we don't have the positions in the documents, if you would also store them, it would be the same uh, data, just in a different representation. Actually, what I just said, for the first exercise sheet, a document may contain a word several times. You should see that it is contained in this list at most once. So even if document 23 contains the word moon three times, 23 is here only once. That's important. And there's a little pitfall here, uh, which is written on the exercise sheet. You have to pay attention that your running time is still OK. It's written on the exercise sheet. So you can also store pairs of, like, say, 23,4, saying moon is contained four times. This is something for lecture two. For lecture one, it's really the most uh, simple way to do it. How do you now process a query? Let's say your query is the word astronauts. You type astronauts, and you want to find the documents containing astronauts. Well, you have pre-computed it. They are the documents for the exercise sheet. You would just output 13, 57, and 61. And of course, you don't output the uh, IDs, but you want the documents or the document titles, I think it's for the sheet. So we just have a, a list where you can look up 13 as movie, blah, and so on. You will just return. You don't have to. Yeah, it's pre-computed. It's very fast. <coughs> how do you do it for two keywords? Here's how you do it for two keywords. And let me just show you the algorithm. It's our first algorithm. And it's really uh, quite simple. <coughs> I will show you the idea. And then you can implement it. So here's the, let me show you the result list here. So you have two lists now. And now you want to find the IDs which occur in both lists, which means you want to compute the intersection of two lists of sorted numbers. And for the algorithm I'm showing you now, it's important that they are sorted. So how do you do it? You start with two pointers. It's not really pointers. It's like indices. Let me call them I and uh, J. And let me maybe write it to the side so that <coughs> doesn't. So this is a variable i, this is a variable j, so it's starting with 0. And now you're comparing the two. They are not equal. And now you're advancing the pointer in the list where it's smaller, where the element is smaller. So I'm advancing here. And you can think about why this is a correct algorithm. We will not prove it now. So I'm advancing in this list. Now I'm comparing 13 and 23. They are not equal. I advanced the pointer in the list where we have the smaller one, so it's now here. Now I'm comparing 57 and 23, not equal. I'm advancing in the list of the smaller one, 23 is smaller, 57. Now I have a, and I think this, I have to write it a little bit lower, and let me just, so that I don't, <coughs> Let me just write it here. So now 57 is in my list. Now I can remove this again. Now I can proceed in both lists because the 57 is there. 61 I process in this list. No match. I proceed here, 114, and so on. <coughs> this way, so that's a simple linear time algorithm to compute the intersection of two sort list. Why is it linear? I think that's easy to see because huh, you are only going to the right. You're not going left, right, or starting again from the top, right? You have these pointers. Either you go one to the right in the one list or in the other list, so you're making progress in every step. And that's why it's linear in the time of the total size of the two lists. The same principle can be used for computing the union for merging. So if you also, if you just want the sorted order of the complete list, this is something <coughs> we will do in the next lecture. For this lecture, it's just intersection. And intersection means you will get the documents which contain both words. OK. This is, uh, let me just see, do I have a? Another, just so that I don't miss any 
Ah, I have one more survey about programming skills you can already mentally prepare. Now, Natalie, I'm not sure in the exercise sheet, is it just two keywords or more than two? Do we have arbitrary number of? We have arbitrary number of keywords, good. So it's not that trivial. How do you do it if you have more than two keywords? So now you have, uh, I don't have an example here, you have K inverted lists, you have to compute the intersection of them. How do you do that? Well, for the exercise sheet, it's good enough you just compute pairwise intersection. Let's say you have three of them first intersect L1 and L2, then you get the intersection of these two, and then intersect that one with the third one. And you can do that in any order, so it's actually simple. You just implement the pairwise one, and then you can intersect an arbitrary number. Here are some possible optimizations. What's a good intersection order? Think about it it makes sense to start with the lists that are smaller because uh, if one of the lists is smaller, you have less work to do. So if you start with the smallest one, L1 and L2, this will probably very be very small and now you are continuing with a small one, intersecting it with the rest. There's a more sophisticated algorithm. You can do a K-way intersect all lists at the same time. You need a priority queue for this. The running time is log k times total sum of the things. If you want, you can implement it. If you feel fancy, we will talk more about this in a later lecture. It's also not too hard if you know a little bit of data structures, algorithms and data structures. Priority queue is what you need. I can maybe very briefly hint at it. Here what you do at each point, you have, so for two, let me just very briefly explain it. For two lists, you have i and j, you have an index for every list. And uh, what you do at every point is you compare these two numbers. If you have k lists, you have k pointers, and at each point you need to find the smallest one of k. And this is what you need the priority queue for, because now you found the smallest one, you throw it out, you advance in that list, you put that one in, you do that with the priority queue. It's not needed, just in case you want to do it, I have explained it. How do we uh, break the text into words? Well, that's conceptually simple, let's just go to our document. You could say, okay, everything is space, that's one way to do it. Uh, we do it even simpler, we just take the regular Latin letters A to Z, even ignore all strange characters, and you just take maximal sequences of those, which means all characters which are not A to Z, capitalized or not, are just separators. And what remains are the words. Uh, yeah. And this is, you can do it as simple as that. In reality, that's actually a, a really hard problem, tokenization, so here are some Examples, that's a famous Japanese haiku, Any, anyone uh, sophisticated in Japanese script here? If you find it out, tell me. German is, uh, or Finnish also has these uh, funny words which are really long and then maybe you want to split that into words too. And then there are these, all these uh, funny characters, UTF-8. So this is the capital Ö, so German umlaut with two dots in capital, and you often see it in capital A tilde minus. Why is that? We will have a lecture about this. UTF-8, Unicode, it's actually quite interesting to understand how that works. So in reality, tokenization is not so easy for this exercise sheet. A and, and if you do a real search, and it's super important to take care of this, but we will ignore it for now. How do you construct an inverted index? I will just leave this here on the slide and now we will just code together something. We'll just do it together, so this is our coding part now and afterwards we have a small break again. So let's just do some, so I'm now here in, yeah, I'm the right directory, I hope. Let's just do inverted index.py, let's see how we we start with a copyright notice. You should also do that. And let's just, okay, let's just start with a, and my Python skills, I haven't used them in a few months, so maybe need some startup time. So uh, this is a simple 
inverted index as explained in lecture one. And there's a typo. And if you see any mistake while I'm doing it and it stays around for longer than three seconds, feel free to shout at me or write it in the chat so that we, yeah, our goal is to have to write the code and then it compiles, it runs, it just works, yeah? So let's see whether we manage that. Okay, so we need a constructor that's in Python that's done with this. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, the inverted, how do we represent the inverted index? We represent the inverted index as a map from words to lists of uh, text record IDs, of IDs of text records. Yeah, so we have a map start with an empty map and we will you will understand this in a second let's now so inverted list so these are my inverted list for every word i have something so it's a map and in the beginning it's the empty map because i don't have any words yet and i think this will become clearer in the following and now we yeah let's uh, Build, <coughs> build an inverted index from a file. Let's just have the file name here. Do we have it with an underscore or without an underscore? We have an underscore, okay. Let's just do it like we do it in the... So, build an inverted index from, a, from the given file. The file contains, and that's like the file we give you, it's also, we also have an example file, I think the file contains uh, one text record per line with tab separated values. That's called TSV, which means you have something, then you have a tabulator, then you have something else. Uh, the first column is the is the title, the second column is the text, the other columns you can ignore for now. And, and I'm doing this live so that you, I am also showing you some coding stuff and so on, so it's actually good practice too. You write a function, you first write what you want to do and then you do it. And maybe as I go along here, I think I should copy my, we, I have an internal here, you don't have it, but I have it. That was one too high up. No, don't, internal. No, it's not, where am I here? Ah, the here I am, I'm here. Okay, I should go to public code, lecture one first, and now I should, one up, one up, and here it should be internal. You don't have internal, I only have internal, because it has the example file here. Yeah. So that's just an example file, just simplified. Also, you will also have to write tests. So here the title is just doc1, doc2, doc3. The text is very simple, and here we have these numbers which we can ignore. And let's just, uh, yeah, let's just, maybe let me uh, oh, edit anyway. For some reason, it's, uh, it's a bit slow. We will be faster with this later. So by the way, what you're seeing here, let me explain this a bit. I'm locked into a machine, which is over there at our, in our rooms. I'm using two windows, one window with a, uh, 
console stuff when I'm running a program. That's one of our machines called Tura. We will use it for the rest of the semester. Here I have an editor. So when I open two windows, you see the name of the file at the bottom. So here at the top, I have opened example TSV. It's at the bottom. This is just some cursor position. Here I've opened the file inverted index.py, and the name is on the bottom. So it makes sense to have them both here. And now let's just write this code together. So we want to open this uh, file. Let's see how much Natalie will help me if I have gaps in my Python skills right now. So I want to open the file. And now I want to iterate over. And you can also think how you, how you would do it over all lines in the file. In Python, that's pretty simple, I think, for line and file. So what do we do now? Now we want to uh, get the title and the text. We ignore the rest. right? That's uh, column 1 and the text, column 2. How do we do that? Let's just try something first. I'm not quite sure how this line split. And now I want, yeah, I'm not quite sure how this works, but we will, if you know it, just tell me. I'm not sure whether I have to, so by what do we want to split? I think by a tabulator, and then I want at most two. I'm not quite sure. If you know it, just tell me what split gives me, but I think it gives me three things then. And let's maybe just uh, run it on the, so let's, let's do a main function to just play around. So if we call this as a main function, then what do we do? Let me just put this up a little bit. So how do we use this? You should always, uh, all your programs should look like this, that in your main function uh, and print usage info. You just read the command line arguments. If it's somehow strange, you show how it should be used. So the command line arguments, I think, are in sys arc v. It's just a list. If you see a, so if it's not two, then let me tell you how it should be printed, uh, executed, Python 3, inverted, index.py, and then it should get a file name. <coughs> and then we exit, maybe with an error code, not important. And then if we called it the right way, then our file name is the first argument. The zeroth argument is always the program itself. If sys, I think we have to include sys here. And if you, <coughs> so how about that? So right now we are just going over the, and then maybe uh, yeah, let's just uh, build from <coughs> example file. How do we do this? We create an inverted index and then we call build from file, <coughs> build from given file. <coughs> So, yeah. <coughs> so, what do you think of this code so far? So now we are just started starting to read the file. Do you think it will run? <coughs> it's uh, also it's our joint. <coughs> responsibility that it works. Let's see. <coughs> That's good. I'm not calling it with the right number of arguments. I should get a... Okay. Build from file takes... What did I do wrong? Here's the error message. Self. Very good. So sometimes I insert errors deliberately, but most of the errors are not deliberate, even if it, I could claim they are for didactic purposes, but it's not true. OK, so it, it does something. It didn't complain anymore. Yeah, let's just see if this works by just printing out the title and the 
Yeah, let's just do it with a space in between just to see how it, just to get used to some Python here. Now I'm just passing title and text, ignoring the rest and printing it out. Let's see how it works. That works, right? So I think we are fine. So now we have the title and the text. And now <coughs> maybe, yeah, index both the title and the text. I think that's also how it's done. Yeah, so let's just add the title to the text. Let's just do it that way. And let's maybe add a space in between. <coughs> And now let's just tokenize this, go over, iterate over all words in the text. Yeah, I also think so. Okay, so how do we split it into words? So for word in, and now we have to split it. I think we need a regex, regular expression. It's a bit weird in Python that you need to call re, and I think it has to be included up here. I mean, it should be really be the string, and then split, and then some regular expression, but you have to, I think this was a weird design choice. And I think now it should be split, I'm sorry, split, and now you have to say by what you split, and I think this, uh, no, wait, in Python, I think it's like this. By what do we want to split? By anything that is not one of these characters. So regex, right? It's a regular expression. That's any character that's not one of the upper or lowercase Latin characters and any sequence of them. And now we split the text. Okay, let's just print the word and see how it works and leave a blank line here. Let's see what it does. That looks good. Now I've split it. There are some blank things here, probably because of we have dots and stuff like this, so we have some empty strings resulting. So we should, I think, first convert the word to lowercase. How do you convert a word to lowercase? In Python? To lower? Like this or with an underscore? Uh, all, all lowercase, to lower in all lowercase, very good. Mm -hmm. So now we have the word and let's just try it. <coughs> just lower. Hmm? Just lower. Yeah. Really? Yeah, looks good. Okay, so now we have all the words and now, okay, if... Uh, yeah, if we have an empty word, we could also remove very short words, but let's not do that. If the length is zero, then we continue with this loop. No colon here. And otherwise, so now, <laughs> now comes, this was all just preparation. Now we have to fill our inverted index. Let's do it. So if we have seen this word for the first time, if not word in, our inverted index is a map from words to list, if not word in self inverted lists, so it's not in that map, then I would say, and you correct me if you have different opinion, I insert it here, and this is an inverted index, so for every word I have a map to an inverted list for that word, and initially if I if I see it for the first time, it's empty. So now after this if, either I've seen it before, there is already a list, or I've seen it for the first time, it's now the empty list. In both cases, I have a list. So let's just have to get used to the word. And now I just append it. Yeah, what do I append? Now I need like the record ID, right? So let's, uh, I think we should have a variable for the record ID, which is zero in the beginning. Whenever I have a new file, I increase it by one. So which means for the first line in the file, it will be one. And now I just append one. And note, this is very nice. Naturally, because I will process the text records in order of increasing IDs, 
the lists I get here and increasing IDs, right? <laughs> what comes later will have a larger record ID, so I don't have to sort them anymore afterwards or anything, which is uh, quite convenient. I think, let's just look at, uh <coughs> let's just remove all the, let's just print them. I think we can just, uh, yeah, let's print the inverted lists and see how they look like, whether it makes sense. These are our, let's just look at the file. This is the file. This is the inverted list. Does it look correct? So we have lowercase stuff because we're not interested in upper or lowercase. Oh, of course, in documents one and two. Doc in all three because we included the title, movie, one, one, three. So here, this you shouldn't do for the sheet, but for now I'll just keep it. So it's just there twice, so the one is also there twice, film is also is there once, it's only in doc two. Any questions about this so far? Okay. So I think that was our that's actually what I wanted and I will one more slide where we will I will show you something. Yeah, here it's written. So this is not how you should do it in the exercise sheet, but for what I want to show you on the next slide, it's actually deliberate. So this is actually more lossless, right? So the information that movie occurs here twice is contained in these lists, but for the exercise sheet you shouldn't do it. For now I want to do it. Is there any question about this simple data structure, these inverted lists? This is what you will work with in the exercise sheet? Okay, no questions, let me go to the, and then we have a quick break again, and then the last part. Here's an interesting law, Zipf's law. It says something, and I wanted to show you that, it's also a popular exam question, I can tell you. Let's just look at how frequent are the words in this collection, and let's look, and before I continue with this, let's just code this together, let's just output not the inverted lists, but let me go through four, let me just iterate over the inverted lists, self, in, no, no, that's not what I want, I want inverted list in, in this inverted list, it's a map, I want it as pairs, I think that works like this, now I just get, <laughs> for, for all my inverted list, the word and the inverted list, and what I want to output is just, I want to know the, what do I want? I want to know the number, the size of the inverted list. The size of the inverted list is how often does the word occur. I will come back to this in a second, think about it. And I want the word. Yeah, I think that's uh, completely right. Thank you. Very good. So here I want the length of the inverted list. And here I want the word. And, if, and let's just see what this prints. Yeah. So what I now did, I just went over the inverted list. So doc, and actually we have seen it before, uh, doc had the inverted list was one, two, three, and this is just the length. So what this tells me, understand, the length of the inverted list is how often this word occurs overall. And because I didn't remove duplicates, I actually have a three for movie now because the word movie occurs three times in document one, again in document one, and in document three. This is just, so what I have here is the number <coughs> for each word, the number of occurrences. And now let's, uh, let's just sort this. Now let's first uh, <coughs> just look at the first. Now let me, let me do it like this. Let me sort this <coughs> with the Unix sort command. You can look it up in the recordings if you're interested in the now I just sorted it by number of, yeah, how often it occurs. The most frequent one first. And actually let me do that now with our real file. Let's just look how it looks like. If 
for our, yeah, I should be able to call the same code on our real file, right? Would take a little bit longer because it's Python, but data sets. What's the most frequent word? What's your guess? Let me just maybe just look at the top. I don't have a survey for this. What are the most? Let's look at the top 20 most frequent words. The end film uh, by maybe not so surprising. And you see the nice thing about computer science. I mean, that's the one great thing about computers. You write something for an example program, example file with three lines. It also works for 100,000 lines. You don't have to change your program. The computer does it for you, right? That's uh, the magic of, that's basically the magic of computers. So we get these frequencies. Now let's just look at the first column. Let's just look at the sorted frequencies and then I will go back to the slide. So this is just giving me the frequencies. Always takes a while, it's passing. So, and the question is, if I plot this now, how will it look like? And let's just uh, look at that, how will it look like? And let me write it into a file. And let me call that file movies uh, word frequencies.txt. It's just uh, what you have just seen in a file. Yeah, it's just the numbers. And now let me plot this. Let's see if I have GNU plot on this machine. Let me plot and let's maybe just show the first 10 of these and you will see in a second how I, uh, what I want to show. Movies dot word. I don't have completion inside the GNU plot. Frequencies.txt. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it works and it's gone because I need to tell it that it should wait. Let me wait for the mouse click. I think that's how it works. Okay, and now I have so just understand this picture. It's easy to understand. This is just Okay, <laughs> the plus here, I can't see it. The most frequent word has a frequency around here. I think it's 300,000 something, and we, we have seen this before. The second most frequent word has this frequency, the third most frequent word has this frequency, and so on. So what's this function here? Looks linear or something, but we just showed the first 10. That's what the 110 here says. It's just take the first 10 lines. Let's maybe take the first 100. Now it looks like this. What function is this? What do you think? It's not a straight line, right? The beginning looks straight, but then it goes like this. And let's maybe take a few more. If I take too many, I think then it crashes. First 1,000. So what you can see is the frequency goes down pretty quickly and then it stays on a, on a low level. <coughs> and this is what's called Ziff's law because the interesting thing is that you take any text on anything if it's halfway meaningful and it will look like this. The picture always looks like this. You have some very frequent words then the frequencies go down very quickly and then you have a lot of these rarer words. Actually, if we would, we can do that. If we go to the end of these, this file here, you will have a lot of ones, a lot of ones. Let me also, uh, if I do it with minus n here, I will see the line numbers. So that's now the first most, second most. So actually we have a lot of words. We have 170, 70, 77 and some things, thousand different words. And you see a lot of them are, yeah, we can go through. Oh my, this is also slow. Everything's slow today. So you have some, so Zip's law says how this behaves and that it behaves like this function. So it's hyperbola, a bit more general than that, one over n to the alpha. And the question is, how do you verify that? I mean, it's just a claim that that is so. Let's just look again at the, at the graph. Here it is. 
Is it really a hyperbola? Maybe there are other functions which look like this. Well, there's one way to check such things, and let me quickly show you. If I, and it's actually written here, but let me also quickly show it to you. So let's say fn, let's say the function is like this. It's c times n to the minus alpha. <coughs> this is equivalent to, let, let's just take the log on both sides, doesn't matter to which basis. Then the log of fn is, well, it's the log of this. Let me just write it out. Log of c times n to the minus alpha. And this is log of the product is sum of the logs. So I will have, a, so let's just take the n minus alpha first. It's log n to the minus alpha, log n to the something. The something comes to the front as a multiplicative factor. So it's minus alpha log n plus log c, just by the log rules. It's also written uh, down here. So what do we have? This means if we take this as our x-axis, which we did, we took, uh, we took this as our x-axis and uh, the n as our, no, that's not true, I, the other way around, I'm sorry. In our plot, what we did, uh, let me just, mm -hmm. We just so a uh, normal plot. What did we do in our normal plot? Uh, they are uh, n, just uh, how many first frequent, second frequent, and so on. So uh, n was the uh, x-axis. Or let me just write it the other way around. People making noise if it's too loud. So the x-axis was uh, our n, 1, 2, 3, and the y-axis was uh, the fn, the frequency. And here, if we do a log-log plot, that's what, uh, that's what a log-log plot is, then the x-axis, we don't plot uh, n, we plot log n. And on the y-axis, there's a delay here. I'm not, it's probably the same reason why everything is so slow. It's log of the frequency. And what should we see then if we take this here? This is now our uh, y and this is our x. And then what we get is, uh, yeah, what's written here is y is minus alpha times x plus log c. And what kind of function is this? Linear. linear. And how does it look? Linear in which way? This, this, this. Will it go up, down? So this is where it will start on the y-axis, so that's something positive. We'll start on the y-axis and the slope is negative. So we, we expect something to start on the y-axis somewhere and then go down negatively. And this, I mean, it doesn't make sense by itself. It's just to verify that the function is really some hyperbolic kind of thing. And let's just try this. I think the way to do it is, uh, I'm not sure, I hope it works, L log scale of my x, y. Yeah, that looks, so there's some wiggly motion in the beginning, probably some deep theory behind it, but uh, it's, it's pretty linear, so it's, yeah, so this is more or less proof that, it's, that it holds. Okay. And, and we see that. So we have a last part, but before that, we just make another break of uh, four minutes or so, and then resume for the last part, which will not be very long. So four minutes break again, then I will meet you again. 
last part, which will not be very long, and it's just to help you with some practical stuff. By the way, I have a CO2 measurement device here, and it says schlecht. Schlecht says so for one hour already. It's a nice German word, schlecht. Schlecht. <coughs> so all the opening, yeah. But I think we will survive. So, a few more, it's just four more slides, and I will show a little bit so that it's on the recording that you see how you should do it. It's about committing stuff and so on. So there's our course management system, uh, Daphne. There's a link on the course wiki. It's actually not important whether you register via his in one. It's just important that you register with us. And it's written on the exercise sheet. It's easy. You will have access to all the data then. And I think I've just, yeah, it looks like this. Let me just upmelden again and unmelden. So what you do is you just, with your uni account, you don't have your own accounts with us, just the uni accounts, and we store your password, of course, f just in case, and then you enter your, your password. And then, so here I have a test user. Maybe I've participated in former courses. This test user has. If you haven't participated in the course yet, you will be asked to enter some some basic information, and you will get a page like this with information about your exercise sheet, points, and so on. Is it okay from the sound level or for you? If it's not okay, close the doors. If it's okay, we can... Yeah, it's, it's just a f few more minutes, so I think we should be fine. And how do you use this? So there's a forum. That's very important. Let me very briefly show you. Here's a link, for example. The link is, is at several places. You can just ask. Uh, <laughs> this also takes a while, but this has something to do with this computer and not with the... Yeah, there are no posts yet. You can ask all kinds of uh, questions here. There's a sub-forum for each exercise sheet. For It's really important that you subscribe to this official channel because whatever will be written there is official. So, you, so it's your responsibility that you read these mails if you, if you miss it. Writing on the forum, we have some guidelines on it. They are also linked on the wiki. Let me uh, very quickly go through them. There's some stuff which you just have to read in the beginning, but you should absolutely read it because it's important. It's very short. It's just these two what you should do before, think a bit about your, uh, for yourself for a few minutes, not too long, don't get frustrated. Google it, sometimes you can just paste the error message into Google, you will find the answer on Stack Overflow. Just look in the forum, maybe somebody has just asked the same question before, and then ask on the forum. And this one is in red because it's important, so let me also briefly say it. Whenever you have an error, on your site and you don't find it and don't spend too much time. Spend a few minutes, but don't spend half an hour. Maybe it's a stupid error and you are not very experienced and this can be super frustrating and, and we see it or somebody else in, in one second. Then you should just ask. It's important how you ask. It's written here, always proper information. Copy and paste the error message, also the relevant code, not all your code, of course. And always, always, that's really important. Whenever you have a problem, make sure that the code causing the problem is in our repository. I will talk about our repository, the SVN, in a second. But this does not mean that's equally important, that you just put your code, whatever it is, 200 lines in your repository, and you say, it doesn't work, please look at it. That's not how it works. It's just a backup. Yeah, you always put your code there, then you ask a question with the error message and maybe an excerpt from your code, and we try to help you or, or someone else from the course with that information. But as a backup, we always have your code and we can look at it, because sometimes it's actually easier to look at the code. But it's only the backup. It's not, here's my code, please find my error. It does not work like this, neither on Stack Overflow, 
nor with us. Yeah, so please read this, just one page, and then, yeah. We will usually answer very quickly, which is important, otherwise it's also frustrating. If for some reason, and let me also say this right away, you need help, some people, maybe you feel like, oh, I've <laughs> I understand so little, I don't even know how to, understand, to ask a proper question. You have a tutor, you can ask them, can we meet, can you explain to me a few things. And of course, we have the Q&A sessions. So, we don't have Git, we have subversion. There will be the usual, actually, it's a, it's a, there's a post on the forum from past years where, where I explain. Yes, we also use, use Git for all our professional uh, projects. For the course, SVN is actually easier. Git has quite a learning curve and quite a few things which are really complicated and you don't need them. So for this, so it's a repository, just you can upload things, you have versioning, you have the history of everything you ever did. And what you basically need is, here's a new file, here's a new version of a file, so you add something, you commit something, or give me the latest version of the files from the server, which for example is feedback from our tutors. So SVN is pretty easy and, and for those purposes just as good as Git, no reason to use Git there. And yeah, that's why we still stick with it. You have a complete history. It's written in the rules, which you should also read. You can also use this as a backup while you work on your exercise sheet. Anytime you can just commit if it works or not, if it's complete uh, chaos or whatever. What counts is your last submission before the deadline. So feel free to use this as, uh, also as a, as a backup. Now I have done something, let me just commit it to the server and go for a lunch or a walk or whatever. That's completely fine. You can commit as often as you want. It's perfectly all right. You find a short tutorial on the wiki. And let me just uh, very briefly show you that so that you have it. So here I have my test user. So if I go to my test user now on the, where is it? Here I think I've logged in. Here's the link to my, so that's what's uh, currently on the server and it's empty. I have nothing here. And now let me just copy, let me just make a, let me make a directory here and let me pretend it's the first exercise sheet. It could be, it should be called sheet minus zero one. It's written on the exercise sheet, so not sheet with a capital S, not without the minus, not, should name it exactly like this. And let's now go to the sheet one and now let's copy my files from, which I've written in the lecture here. And I've written, uh, oh yeah, this make file, I will briefly explain it and the inverted index. Let me just copy we have written together the inverted index.py and we also have this uh, ex yeah, example TSV here and let me just uh, yeah let me and let me now add them so SVN add means and if I add a whole directory it will add all files in the directory so add is not it's not on the server now this it went way too fast for that add means Here's something which I intend to upload for the first time. So it's like scheduling for upload. That's what add does in SVN, yeah? So it's uh, scheduled for upload now. And if I actually want to commit it now, I can do commit. I don't have to write anything anymore because these are already scheduled for. If I now commit these files, now I will get the usual editor window. I can say, uh, yeah, files from L1 under the false name sheet one. It's actually lecture one, it's some meaningful comment. Now I will upload them to the server <coughs> and now you should see them here. Yeah, now they are here, now they are on our server, you can do that. Now if I make a change and I do commit, it will just commit the changes, yes? How yeah. can the window be closed? <coughs> like the, the, the actual committed message? The editor 
You are talking about the editor which pops up, yes. how it can be closed. Actually, <coughs> I think there is a, I think the problem is SVN. Ah, I'm, ah, now I know, now I know. SVN, no, visual, yeah. There's an environment variable, visual, which tells you the default editor. And maybe on your system, it's a strange editor. It's like, I don't know, one where you don't know how to exit it. I think with this environment variable, if you set it to whatever you want to set it to, you can configure the editor that will be used. So for me, it's Vim right now. And Vim, you exit with colon Q or colon WQ. It depends on the editor that opens. And then you have to leave that editor with a write and quit. So now I have the files here. They are uploaded now, my three files. And more than that, if you go to, if I go here to my overview page of the test user, now I will see it did something automatically. And let's look at here what it did. So what it does every time you commit something, and you can ignore that for intermediate commits, it will try to do something with your code. It will compile it. And that's actually what's written here in the make file, which I didn't show you so far. So the make file just contained, and you should always take the same make file for all exercise sheets in the course. It will tell you how to compile. Now, Python doesn't really need compiling. It's just checking the syntax. It will check your unit tests. I don't have any unit tests here. We'll show that in the next lecture, and you will see it in the exercise sheet. It will check the style, style errors, whether you uh, in did. Er let's just maybe, so Flake 8 is the program for that. Let me just, yeah, and here we see a problem. So I had two style errors. So in line 38, I had trailing white spaces. That's, of course, a terrible sin. I have two white spaces in the end. Style checker does not like this. Let me just remove it. It's still there. Oh, yeah, because I'm now in the, I see, I'm now, I copied these files. So let me just very quickly. Go to the right uh, internal internal code lecture. No, no, this was. I have to go to my test user. Test user sheet one inverted index dot pi thirty eight. Here we are. But you see the purpose of this uh, automatic build system. It will tell you there's something wrong. So now I remove this. Now it tells me should be not in. Uh -huh. So it even gives me interesting. So this is actually correct, but uh, the style checker says it's better practice to say not, n not, not in, but not in. Like this. Nice. So now I have changes. So if I do status now, it will tell me M stands for merge. I can just commit them. Actually, a short form for commit is just CI. And I just write what I did, fixed check style errors. Now I upload them. Now I go to my system. Now I have the latest files. And now it, it should build automatically. It should check everything automatically. And it does. So there's a current build running now, it says here. And uh, I don't know if we can. Yeah, it's running right now. Let's see if this works. Sometimes needs some time. The most frequent one is at the top. So you can see I already did a fair bit of testing here. Try it yourself. I think I won't show any more about this now. If you have problems with this, just come to the Q&A on Friday, and we can help you with that. But essentially, what it does, it, it will check it out on our server and just try to see if everything compiles, if the test works if everything is all right. This is what I, yeah, this is what I just show you. Let me just see, we are almost done with our, ah yeah, now it gets, so there we are. So now it did 
checked for syntax errors, ran it, checked the style, everything is fine. This is important <coughs> because just it works for you doesn't mean that it works for us. Maybe you forgot to commit a file for something. So if you have a green arrow here, uh, then you know it also works uh, what you uploaded to our site. <coughs> Before we leave, very quickly, and then short opportunity to ask uh, questions, the exercise sheet. <coughs> Just give me one more minute. It's a bit, everything a bit slow here. We have seen it already. And please do ask a question if you have one. It's basically inverting this very simple uh, search engine here. Deadline is until noon next week. Uh, yeah, register on Daphne and so on. It tells you exactly how to commit and everything is there. Oh, I have a, <coughs> I have a final poll to make. And, and while the poll is running, opportunity, last opportunity for asking questions. There's a last poll, yeah? Um, what are the rules about importing packages? So for example, Namtai yeah. or yeah, that's a very good question. The question is, what are the rules for using stuff from other library importing packages? The rule is, later we will use NumPy and stuff. For now, you shouldn't. For the first lectures, just ask. You don't re re need anything else, really, except for something like sys or regular expression. So if you intend to bring it like some monster library, I don't know, the information retrieval library or search engine stuff, you should probably shouldn't or you should ask us. Actually, it's on, written on the exercise sheet for intersecting two lists. You should not use a library which intersects two lists. You should write it yourself. That's the point of the exercise. So when in doubt, ask in the later lectures. You can use some stuff like NumPy. Any other questions? So. Here, we have some awesome programmers. One-fifth of the audience are awesome programmers, okay? And some others are... <laughs> okay, nobody, we had 20% of people who said, I don't mind the math, but we have no one who says, uh, leave out, just do it pure theory. So you are, you are all eager to do some coding. That's nice. Any other question before we close for today? Okay. Oh, there's one more. Yes. I if and when the recordings are provided, we try to do this as quickly as possible, which means right after this, our cutter, our professional, semi-professional editor will start his work, but it takes a few hours because we do some post-processing, we add timestamps. It's usually on the same day, but in the evening, maybe late evening but we try to have them ready on the same day, so pretty quickly. Any other questions? So thank you, that's it for today. See you next week.